Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this session of the Global Seminar Series. Um, today, we have, we're bringing um, a speaker to you from East Africa, um, Jared Bosetti. He is a program manager based in Nairobi um, with the UN Environmental Program Nairobi Convention. And Jeff's talk is going to, oh, there it is, Turning the Tide, a Super Decade of Opportunities. I want to give you just a little bit of background on, uh, on Jared. He has a PhD in marine science with more than 20 years of experience focusing on environmental sustainability in various sectors ranging from wildlife, freshwater, energy, and climate change, forestry, and coastal marine systems. Um, he has been working um, and a whole range of organizations um, prior to joining um, UNEP. And he is a recipient of a Royal Academy of Overseas Science Award by the Belgian government and the International Fellow of the Year for the Society for Wetland Scientists. And he also um, has another, a number of other distinguished uh, awards. And I'm not gonna spend any more time on Jared. You can see his bio online if you care to, but I want to get right into the presentation. So Jared, very, welcome very much. And we look forward to your talk on Turning the Tide, a super decade of opportunities. You're on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who are in the time zone where it is afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on the time zones where you are, or morning as well. Uh, so, as I have been introduced, my name is Jared uh, Bosir. I work at the UNEP uh, Nairobi Convention, and it's my honor to be here uh, to engage uh, in this very important um, uh, thematic, uh, thematic issue of concern. Uh, I should give you a brief background of what the UNEP Nairobi Convention is. Uh, the convention is a legal uh, framework and a platform for regional collaboration between countries uh, and partners. And the mandate of the convention is for the protection uh, management and the development of the Western Indian Ocean region. Uh, at regional level, as you can see, the countries of the Western Indian Ocean region are highlighted here. I will show you uh, which ones those countries are in my next slide. Uh, the vision of the convention is to be a partnership and that is what it is, a partnership between governments who we call the contracting parties or member states, civil society, uh, the private sector work, working towards a prosperous Western Indian Ocean region. So the, there are 10 contracting parties. Uh, there are 10 contracting parties who are members of the, of the convention. And these are the countries that are found in the Eastern Africa region. Uh, there are five mainland states and five island states, as you can see them listed here. Uh, the five mainland states include Somalia, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, and South Africa. And they are just an island states of Seychelles, uh, Comoro, Madagascar, Mauritius, and France through one of the, uh, of the islands in the region called uh, Reunion. Now, uh, so UNEP is one of the regional seas administered programs. Uh, there are six UNEP administered regional seas programs and the Nairobi Convention is the regional seas program that covers, that covers the region. Now, the, uh, the convention uh, works with a number of partnerships. Uh, of course, starting with sister UN agencies. Uh, we work with a number of civil society organizations uh, we work with um, intergovernmental uh, organizations as well. We work with the national institutions uh, in different countries and the national governments uh, as well. We also work with regional economic communities and the commissions and for the African continent, uh, in short, we call them the RECs. These are the implementing arms of the Africa Union and they are responsible for the implementation, monitoring and evaluation of Agenda 2063 which is the blueprint, uh, uh, blueprint agenda for development uh, for, the, for the African Union. And some of the regional econ economic uh, communities and commissions are highlighted here, including SADC, which is the South Africa Development Corporation, the East African Community, uh, among others. So then to set the framework uh, for the presentation, 
uh, is that when you look at the map of the African continent, you actually see very expansive um, development corridors that are running, especially along coastal areas to the hinterlands. Uh, these development corridors comprise of huge infrastructural developments, which include ports, railways and roads, uh, airports, among other infrastructure related to transport. Uh, as you can see, the coastlines of Africa look pretty busy. Uh, that is where we are having a concentration of huge infrastructure developments at the moment. Uh, while the countries must develop you know, for their GDP, create employment opportunities and enhance their balance of trade, uh, but these developments also intersect with uh, areas of um, rich biodiversity uh, or areas which have a lot of environmental significance. And that is the challenge that we have to deal with from a sustainability perspective. And what is uh, driving these huge developments? The huge developments are being driven by huge financial inflows, uh, either from uh, foreign di direct investments, remittances, or overseas development uh, aid, as you can see here. And there is quite a steep increase of financial inflows into the continent. And these are the ones that are driving the uh, the huge infrastructural developments that we that we are seeing around around the coastlines uh, of the uh, of the Africa continent. Uh, these developments, of course, not just within Africa but globally as well, uh, are precipitating uh, very significant uh, environmental changes. Of course, globally, we are experiencing a huge population increase, as you can see uh, on the graph on the top uh, left. Um, and huge population increase would normally lead to demand for resources, demand for food production, increased demand for water, and this can lead to increased carbon emissions, um, increased uh, tropical forest loss, uh, because there is land that is required for agriculture, for food production, uh, among other environmental impacts, including huge demands uh, for fresh water uh, as well. And when you look at this graph, it's quite interesting because uh, from 1961, okay, up to 2012, actually I was che just checking the current literature in 2020, uh, there has been significant increase in demand of resources uh, to provide for uh, services for humanity, you know, in terms of food, water, and among other resources. And currently, uh, our consumption globally has actually exceeded the ecological footprint or the biocapacity of the earth to support the demand for resources. Uh, between 1961, and the 2012, uh, that ecological footprint in terms of the dependence of human beings on the environment for their resources has increased by 100%. And this has had significant environmental impacts, including habitat loss, loss of species, and also accumulation of atmospheric carbon, uh, which is precipitating, of course, global warming. Yeah, so we seem to be uh, operating within a, 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 a space that is not very healthy, even for our continued uh, existence. Uh, from an ocean governance perspective, some of the uh, threats that are facing, you know, um, marine and coastal resources include, you know, biodiversity and habitat loss, illegal fishing, overfishing as well. Uh, pollution from land-based sources is a major threat to the marine environment. Uh, climate change. Uh, is a current and topical issue, uh, challenges around governance, but there are also new opportunities within the continent, which include extractives like minerals and oil and gas and the infrastructural expansion like ports. Uh, all of these uh, developments are having a huge environmental, uh, environmental footprint. Um, and from the Living Planet report, which is a, a report that is normally produced by the Zoological Society of London and WWF, um, pretty much within our lifetime, uh, for many of us, between 1970 and, and now, actually, um, globally, we have lost about 68% of, of the population of major species. 
And these are very significant, uh, you know, laws that has happened within, you know, within our lifetime. And uh, most of the species that has been lost, a percentage of 84% are actually freshwater species. And these species are important because they support, you know, provision of important uh, environmental functions. Uh, they drive local and national economies and they bring equilibrium in the environment. So with, the, with these very significant losses, uh, then, then this brings a lot of instability uh, uh, in the environment. Uh, and of course, global change is already impacting our health. We believe that some of the challenges that humanity is suffering in terms of health, including you know, uh, pandemics or epidemics are related to environmental degradation, affecting our wealth and security uh, as well. So the challenge is, can we be able to bend the curve on biodiversity loss? That is why I decided to focus on turning the tide or bending the curve by focusing on the opportunities which are presented within this super decade between 2021 and 2030, uh, this super decade of about um, you know, uh, 10 years. And I will highlight why it is a super decade. So when we look at the curve on biodiversity loss, it has been steep and consistent over the years, as I've highlighted before. And we have lost um, you know, a very high um, you know, population of major species. As you can see up to 2020, we lost about you know, 67% of the population of major species globally. And the trend is you know, continuing in terms of loss you know, over the years. And we are wondering by 2030, where will we be? There's therefore need to make huge and concerted investments to bend the carbon biodiversity loss. Um, and this is going to take a lot of effort at different levels, you know, from sub-national to national, regional, and the global levels as well, to turn the curve on biodiversity loss. And there will be a number of very important actions that will be required to bend the curve on biodiversity loss. Some of those actions will include reducing greenhouse emissions by 50% from the current rates, uh, reducing the impacts of food production uh, by 50%, doubling sustainable fisheries, uh, keeping major rivers flowing because major rivers bring fresh water, they bring nutrients and productivity to the coastal and marine environment, uh, stopping deforestation, eliminating poaching, and protecting 30% of our land and the sea. As you can look at the scope and the scale uh, of these actions, the question that I have is that, are we working at a scale that matters to actually bend the carbon biodiversity laws. Or we are having a lot of conservation efforts going on, but which are very scattered, and the cumulative impact may probably be limited. Uh, uh, that is the question. And that is where the opportunities which the super decade presents then become very, very important. Uh, but there are choices that we should make as humanity uh, to improve the state of our environment and therefore uh, guarantee our future. Uh, some of these choices that we have to make include redirecting financial flows uh, into investments that take environmental risk into account and promote sustainability, because development is driven by, uh, uh, by, by financial inflows or investments. How can banking and financial institutions direct financial resources uh, to developments which take into account environmental risk uh, and therefore promote sustainability? Uh, the other important action will be preservation of natural capital uh, to restore uh, uh, resources that have been degraded you know, in the course of time so they can be able to provide uh, relevant environmental services. Uh, the other important uh, action uh, will be efficient production uh, that uses less investments. We can produce better than we do. Uh, there's a lot of wastage in production processes, but there's a lot, also a lot of wastage in consumption. Uh, when you look at how much food is produced and consumed, there's a lot of wastage. So if we can invest in efficient production processes and promote efficient consumption, we can actually reduce our environmental footprint. Uh, the other aspect, of course, which is overarching is to ensure uh, equity in the governance of natural resources. And these five uh, very important actions then can lead to enhanced ecosystem integrity, 
enhanced biodiversity conservation and will ensure that we have food, water, and even energy security, okay? Uh, so I want us to look at uh, some of the key opportunities for the decade. Uh, one of those is the UN Decade of Ocean Science uh, and the UN agency that is leading on this one working with the diverse partners globally is the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, which is a sister UN agency. Uh, this is important because there is need to invest in science that informs policy. Uh, so what we find is that there's a lot of science that, that goes on, which is either basic science or research or applied science. Uh, some of the outputs from basic or applied science uh, can be turned into technical publications or scientific publications, but very few uh, of these scientific outputs actually influence policy. So during the decade of ocean science, how can we ensure that research informs policy so that policymakers and managers can make uh, decisions based on evidence or based on science? Uh, this will be a critical consideration during the decade of uh, the decade of ocean science. Uh, within the Nairobi Convention, uh, the contracting parties or the governments, for the last couple of years, through what we call conference of parties decisions have requested the secretariat where I work to strengthen the link between science and policy by organizing regular science to policy dialogues uh, to ensure that science informs management and policy. Uh, and the governments have spoken and made this demand through various conference of, of parties decisions. In 2019, uh, following this conference of parties decisions, uh, a science to policy platform was established as a structure uh, within the convention. And what is the rationale for this science to policy platform that was established in 2019 and endorsed and approved by all the governments? It is to support evidence-based decision-making. Uh, the platform also serves as a formal structure within the convention uh, to enhance policy science dialogues it is also a much, a much stakeholder platform that brings together uh, diverse practitioners from technical experts, uh, policymakers, communities, and the private sector as well. And this science to policy platform serves as an intermediary body to bridge the gap between science, policy, and practice. Uh, and I should report that there has been a lot of progress uh, from the time the science to policy platform was established uh, because Many of the policy decisions made by governments in the region now, in terms of ocean governance, are actually guided by science, uh, and these are very, very significant, uh, significant contribution. Uh, I thought I should highlight one example where science has contributed significantly uh, to uh, to management or policy. Uh, just um, just about two years ago, uh, that was in 2020. No, actually last year, last year July. Uh, we launched the Marine Protected Areas Outlook for the Western Indian Ocean region. I don't know the composition of the audience, of course, but marine, marine protected areas are areas of the coast or the marine environment that are set aside and given some level of protection to ensure that the resources are conserved or sustainably managed. As you can see, the flags that are, that are shown here, these are the contracting parties to the convention that I mentioned before. And this outlook was developed uh, uh, by all the governments of the region. This is the cover page uh, for the outlook. And the objective of the outlook was to support the contracting parties to track the progress, the progress, the, the progress they had made uh, towards the SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, target number 14.5, where commitments, where governments in 2015 committed that they will conserve at least 10% of their coastal and marine areas. Uh, the other objective of this marine protected areas outlook was to also serve as a baseline for the global biodiversity uh, framework, which is currently undergoing a negotiation under the Convention for Biological Diversity uh, of the UN. Negotiations are still continuing. Uh, this slide shows the 
uh, the country chapters for each of the countries of the region. You can see the names of the countries here. Uh, those are the cover pages for the country chapters of the MPA Outlook, you know, Comoro, the French territories, Mozambique, Kenya, Mauritius, and all the countries. So each country has its own chapter that it documents MPAs for each respective country. What is the status of management at the moment, the spatial extent, and the proposed areas for enhanced protection? Uh, the outlook also highlights a number of very important case studies. Uh, I will just give three examples only here. Uh, for instance, there's a very important case study from Madagascar on how communities are coming together and protecting their coastal and marine resources through what is called locally managed marine areas that gives communities a voice in the management of their resources. Uh, they have about 200 locally managed marine areas in Madagascar. Uh, another case study that is highlighted is the Seychelles Marine Special Planning Initiative. Seychelles actually is one of the island states in the region, a contracting party to the convention, and it's a front runner in marine spatial planning. I will shortly define what marine spatial planning is uh, for the sake of everyone in case there are some who have not in interacted with this tool uh, that is important for coastal uh, and marine planning. Uh, there's also a case study on MPA governance in Kenya, among many other case studies that, that were covered in the, in the outlook. So what were the key findings of the outlook? And this is where science becomes very, very important. Uh, some of the key findings were that the whole region, you know, the Western Indian Ocean region, has 143 marine protected areas uh, covering about 550,000 square kilometers, uh, which is representing 7% of the total exclusive economic zone of the region. The exclusive economic zone is the area up to 200 nautical miles of each country. Interestingly, 63% of this area has been brought under protection since 2015 when the SDG framework was adopted. And this emphasizes the commitment uh, that the governments have made, you know, have had towards SDG, uh, the, the agenda 2030. Um, one other observation that was made as well is that there exists in different countries legislative and institutional frameworks for the establishment and the management of MPAs, which is an indication of political goodwill uh, across the different countries. And as I mentioned before, that the community participation has, has been a key aspect in the management of coastal and marine areas uh, through locally managed marine areas. Uh, a number of key challenges were observed when uh, compiling this MPA outlook for the region. There are challenges around enforcement and compliance that is weak, inadequate financial and personnel capacity uh, for the effective management of these MPAs, uh, climate change and pollution as key threats to the management of MPAs, and there's also an increased footprint of coastal developments uh, among the key challenges that were, that were observed. Uh, one of the major outputs uh, for the MPA Outlook uh, is a very interactive dashboard, very dynamic, that was developed. Uh, the dashboard is interactive. Uh, it's available at the Nairobi Convention website. You can access it. Uh, it gives you metrics uh, for MPAs of the region at regional level. Like you can see the summary on the panel on my uh, on the on the left. Uh, the summary there: 143 MPAs covering 550,000 square kilometers and other metrics. And if you click on the, on the flag of each country, it will now take you to the MPA dashboard for each respective country. I will show you, for instance, the dashboard for seashells here. It shows the number of MPAs in seashells, the spatial extent in terms of square kilometers. It also shows you My, my, my apologies, I seem to have lost connectivity. Uh, I don't know what happened, uh, very unfortunate. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. My apologies for that, uh, but I will still finish uh, within the time allocated. Uh, I lost connectivity momentarily here. Understood, thank you for coming back. Uh, let, let, let me share my presentation again, um, sorry for that. Uh, can, can I uh, please be made a co-host so that I can share my, my screen? Thank you, thank you for that. 
when a connection goes over the wrong time. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I will put this on slideshow. Okay, there we are. And um, I hope you can you can see my screen, sorry for that. Yeah, so I was actually defining what um, marine spatial planning is. So it's a public process uh, that ensures there's a, there's a nexus between the environment, uh, the economy, and the social objectives in terms of analyzing and allocating the spatial and the temporal distribution of human activities within the marine environment. Uh, so MSP ensures uh, integration of the complexity of ecosystems as well as the interaction between humans and ecological systems, okay? Um, so currently, uh, many governments are using MSP or marine spatial planning as a tool in their blue economy ambitions. Uh, blue economy, blue here represents, of course, the ocean, uh, and it doesn't represent the ocean only, it also represents even inland waters, lakes and rivers, especially for countries that are landlocked. Uh, so many governments are currently uh, implement, sorry, uh, investing in a blue economy as a concept uh, to promote economic growth, social inclusion and ensure the preservation or, uh, or improvement of livelihoods, while at the same time ensuring environmental sustainability. I have used three case studies in the region. In 2018, the Kenyan government uh, hosted a global conference uh, on sustainable blue economy here in Nairobi, uh, which has spurred a lot of momentum globally towards uh, sustainability of oceans. Uh, the South African government has made a lot of investment in an, in an approach they call Operation Pakisa, which is promoting sustainable management of their oceans. And as I mentioned about seashells before, uh, seashells, it's a small island country in the region, but it's a front runner in terms of marine spatial planning. By the way, in 2019, Seychelles managed to achieve uh, a target of bringing 30% of the EEZ exclusive economic zone under protection, a major, a major milestone. So what uh, are the requirements then for successful blue economy development? The country must have a vision for its blue economy agenda, uh, there must be an enabling policy environment, a supporting institutional frameworks for the implementation of blue economy. There must be requisite capacity, you know, technical and otherwise. Uh, information and data will be key to inform decision making. Financial resources are required, and of course, a mechanism for implementation and enforcement. Uh, all these are requirements or ingredients for ingredients for successful implementation. Uh, of any, any blue economy uh, ambitions. And for countries that are able to successfully implement their blue economy ambitions, uh, you can see they lead to harnessing of renewable energy from the sea, uh, support sustainable fisheries, and overly, uh, blue economy as an approach should lead to creation of jobs, reduce poverty, and even reduce hunger uh, as well. Uh, the second most important uh, framework within this super decade is the Agenda 2030 on Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which is rallying governments you know, across the world to support sustainability through different uh, uh, sustainable development goals with their associated targets and indicators. And I don't have to go through Agenda 2030, I guess many of us uh, in the meeting have interacted with this. Uh, so Agenda 2030 within this super decade between now, you know, uh, up to 2030 provides momentum and a framework to support sustainability and the turn the tide on environmental degradation globally. We also have the third one, which is the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which is a partnership between FAO of the United Nations, the United Nations Environment Program, and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration uh, is a rallying call for the protection and revival of ecosystems all around the world for the benefit of people and the nature. And the aim is to hold, uh, to, to bring to hold uh, degradation of ecosystems and restore them to achieve global goals. So during this decade of ecosystem restoration, there will be many restoration initi initiatives as a way of restoring degraded ecosystems and returning the, ecos the ecosystem services uh, they provide uh, to humanity. 
Uh, from the Nairobi Convention, we have developed a number of ecosystem restoration guidelines. As you can see on the left is a guideline on mangrove restoration that was developed and launched uh, in 2020. Uh, in the middle is a guideline on seagrass ecosystem restoration. Uh, on the right is a guideline on conducting environmental flow assessment uh, to ensure that it's a sustainable river flows uh, within the region. Among other guidelines that have been developed, these are just examples. Uh, the other major uh, global commitment uh, that should help in turning the tide during this super decade is the Paris 2015 agreement, which has subsequently been followed by the Glasgow uh, Climate Change Compact, uh, uh, which was arrived at during COP26 uh, that was held in Glasgow a few, a few months ago. Um, and of course, we recognize that climate change is an emergency that needs accelerated action. Uh, a number of actions are important to um, reduce the impact of climate change, uh, moving away from fossil fuels, uh, delivering on climate change uh, finance of $100 billion uh, US dollars per year, stepping up support for adaptation, especially in vulnerable countries which suffer from droughts and the floods as well, and uh, completing the Paris rule book, which provides guidelines on how countries will meet their commitments under their nationally determined contributions. Uh, something that was discussed during the Glasgow meeting, but not agreed on, is how countries can focus on loss and damage, and how countries that are most hurt by climate change can actually be compensated. This was a, this was a controversial issue during the meeting and there, there was no agreement that was reached. It was deferred for further, uh, for further discussion. Uh, the last framework that is very, very important during this decade, uh, which can help in turning the tide and promoting sustainability is the post-2020 global biodiversity uh, framework. Now, this is the uh, successor to the uh, IHE targets and it related uh, uh, convention for biodiversity, you know, conservation uh, strategy. Currently, discussions are going on under the Convention on Biological Diversity to agree on very important targets globally to conserve biodiversity. What has been recognized, and I think there's consensus on this globally, is that bold actions are required now and not later if we are to turn the tide on environmental degradation globally. Some of the provisional targets that have been proposed, and I call them provisional because uh, the targets are still under negotiation. They met in Geneva, I think about last month, and they couldn't agree. And the next meeting will be held in Nairobi in June to try and see whether uh, globally governments can agree on important uh, biodiversity commitments uh, to guide uh, you know, the world in terms of promoting sustainability between now and 2030. Some of the provisional targets that have been proposed is that at least 30% of land and the sea areas globally are conserved through effective, equitably managed, and ecologically representative areas. Another target that has been proposed, just as, a, as examples, is a 50% reduction in the rate of introduction of alien or new species uh, because of the huge environmental impacts introduced species have. Uh, one of the other targets that have been proposed is reducing nutrients, nutrient loss or leakage to the environment by at least 50%, and the pesticides, especially used in agriculture, by at least two thirds, and eliminating the discharge of plastic waste into the environment. I should indicate here that during uh, UNEA, the United Nations Environment Assembly meeting in Nairobi uh, between uh, end of February and beginning of March this year, uh, the governments agreed to form uh, an international negotiating committee to negotiate or draft a framework uh, to develop an internationally binding agreement on plastic and the marine litter globally. This was hailed as important success. So between now and 2024, uh, there will be 
uh, an international negotiating committee that will be negotiating an internationally uh, legally binding agreement on plastic and marine litter to manage the menace of uh, plastic in the environment as, and especially discharge into, 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 into our waters. Uh, the other target that has been proposed under the post-2020 global biodiversity framework is that nature-based uh, contributions to global climate change mitigate efforts and reduce emissions by at least 10 gigatons of carbon per year, a very ambitious target. So as I come to the end of my presentation, because I wanted to stay within the time uh, that was allocated, is that the super decade between now, uh, starting from last year up to 2030, uh, provides a great opportunity uh, globally because of this very, very important global uh, environmental agreements, which should uh, increase momentum by governments, subnational governments to work towards sustainability. And because of the scale of environmental degradation that has been experienced, there is urgency for governments to work to promote sustainability, even for the sake of our own lives, you know, here, here on earth. Uh, it is my hope that governments will take their place, you know, uh, they will take concerted actions, there will be strong synergy and collaboration at regional level, at global level, to take advantage of the momentum uh, of the super decade and the turn the tide towards environmental sustainability. I want to thank you for the time. Uh, this work that I've been presented here is work that has been variously supported by many uh, regional partners, uh, including the Global Environment Facility, that is the CHEF. And I want to thank uh, the management of Cornell University for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much and over to you. Thank you. Good. That was a very stimulating presentation. Lots of food for thought. I'm going to open it up to questions now from our um, uh, audience present and also to our virtual audience, curiously. <laughs> I'm going to start locally. Anybody have any comments or questions for Jared? Here's one. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bosir Asante Sana, for a very uh, wonderful presentation. I have a question about uh, deep water uh, offshore fishing in Africa. There's been several cases in the media about vessels, mostly from you know Asian countries, coming into uh, African waters and been alleged with overfishing. Uh, can you comment on what is being done? What what exists in terms of monitoring and uh, enforcement of those kind of regulations uh, of the cost of uh, African uh, waters in terms of fishing and the blue economy? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, that is a very pertinent issue. Actually, a lot of resources are being in terms of fisheries are being lost uh, because of um, lack of regulations and enforcement. Um, what the government must do is that governments must invest in uh, monitoring, control, and surveillance to protect their own resources. Uh, unfortunately, countries globally will tend to take care of their own national interest at the expense of other countries. Uh, it is the way that it works in the world. Yeah, so developing states should invest in monitoring, control, and surveillance, and they won't have to manage these investments on their own uh, because it's expensive to invest in vessels and other related infrastructure. Uh, but countries could come together as regional blocks and, and invest in infrastructure that can enable them to monitor, to conduct surveillance, uh, and therefore be able to protect their resources. There's no choice about this. It's about enhanced monitoring control and surveillance, and this would require investment. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, um, for your response. We have a question from um, one of our virtual participants. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, Dr. Raman can unmute and ask your question in person. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Oh, I just wanted uh, you to give us uh, an idea about uh, you know the convention and uh, how it's going to be implementing post 2020 
given that uh, COVID-19 has become so rampant in uh, major parts of uh, the areas where you are operating. My second question is on, you know, countries such as US and Australia, which have not ratified the convention. Is that in any way impacting your overall approach in the region? Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, on COVID, we actually uh, commissioned an assessment um, to determine the impacts of COVID, especially on the management of coastal and marine resources within the region, uh, which also covered one of the other uh, convention managed by UNEP, that is the Katahina Convention in the Caribbean. Now, the good news is that because during COVID there were restrictions, it means the environment was given space to have a breather. <laughs> and there were positive developments, all right? Yeah, but what we have also observed is that when the restrictions were eased, there was an upsurge in terms of pressure, which again has started to show or manifest itself in terms of impacts on natural resources. I think it is to recognize that the lessons that we learned from COVID is that nature needs to be given space, a breather, we don't have to continuously exploit resources. We can come up with mechanisms that can um, protect resources by closing them out from you know, exploitation for some time and coming up with better management regimes that reduce pressure on the environment. Uh, I, I talked about marine protected areas, for instance. Uh, that is one very good approach that has been successful. Uh, which can be promoted globally uh, in different areas, okay? Now, about some countries not being signatories to, uh, to certain conventions, uh, not every country normally commits uh, to global conventions. Countries will have their own good reasons why they should not commit to a particular convention. Uh, but it is to indicate that we are a community of nations and resources cannot be managed by a few countries to the exclusion of others. Each country has a contribution to make. If it is a mission of greenhouse gases, for instance, the efforts of a few countries will not turn the tide, but all countries will need to work together and have a concerted effort. So it's just a challenge that we are a community of nations and each country has an important contribution to make and that therefore they should play their honest part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jared. I'm going to invite another question from our uh, direct audience here. Any questions for Jared? Comments? Okay, well, we have some more from <laughs> our remote viewers. So, um, Polly, would you like to ask your question to Jared? Or would you like me to read it, the one that you've put in chat? Um, sure, I can, uh, I can ask. Thank you so much, uh, Jared, for this presentation. Um, I'm thinking about marine protected areas and ocean acidification and ocean warming and um, the fact that those are also very global issues. And often I wonder about how we truly manage well these marine protected areas when those threats are coming at us and there's not much we can do at a local level to um, offset ocean acidification and warming that has a cascading ecological effect on the food webs? Or are you seeing some um, local actions uh, like planting seaweeds and things like that that might be able to offset these threats? Um, so I guess my question is, is it just one of those things that we need to have the global uh, commitment in order to, to truly protect them or is a regional um, coordination uh, significant enough? Uh, thank you, Polly, for that. Now, looking at ocean acidification, for instance, that is one of the manifestations, of course, of climate change, ocean warming as well. Uh, there's a lot of literature, of course, confirming how ocean warming has led to degradation of especially coral reefs, for instance. Uh, during episodic events, uh, what we call the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And so 
elevated sea surface temperature leading to uh, coral bleaching and the implications of that on the integrity of the ecosystems, fisheries, and the livelihoods that depend on the resources. Such have been recorded, especially the last about 20 years or so, we have had fairly frequent uh, events. Now, while actions can be taken at site level, and there's a lot of evidence to confirm uh, that actions taken at site level uh, with improved management can enhance resilience and even recovery uh, to make an important difference. That is why I talked about, are we working at a scale that matters? That will require regional and even global efforts. That is why governments are investing in actually coming up with these global commitments uh, where governments can you know, rally each other to work towards certain you know, global commitments. Uh, if a few countries in some corner of the world are so effective in managing their resources, their effects may be counteracted by negative um, you know, impacts from other parts of the world. So without discounting the importance of local or national you know, um, management and the benefits thereof, uh, national and subnational management uh, regimes are very, very important, but to make meaningful global change and impact, there is need for collaboration at both a regional and a global level. That is why these global commitments that are presented here are actually very, very important. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jared. Our time is up. That was a very stimulating presentation. We really appreciate and uh, wish you the very best. Let us. Uh, to a round of uh, appreciation for Jared. Thank you. Have a stay in touch. Thank you. Challenges together. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very it much. It was my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you.